while I have you guys here, I want you guys to get a little bit more interactive with me and everything. Um, do we have any military members here or vets here or police officers? So give them a big round of applause because I gotta tell you something. It is, it falls on every single one of us to protect our rights here in this country, but they are out there fighting for our rights abroad. And it's, uh, it's really appreciated. And if you get an opportunity, you see those people that raise their hands and everything, certainly stop by and, and always just reach out to them and thank them for their service, no matter, no matter who they are, what, what branch they serve in or local police officers and everything too. You know, at this year's CPAC, uh, I was down there, I've been there for the last three years now, and uh, it's, it's an experience if you ever get the chance, but Ben Shapiro, a political commentator, was down there, and he asked the audience two questions that I thought was very important. I want to ask you guys those questions here today. How many of you feel bad and are against school shootings and what's going on with the victims of school shootings? How many of you out there are against that? Okay, how many of you are for the Second Amendment? The media doesn't seem to understand that we can be for both of those things and that those two things can coincide with each other. And that's the point that Ben Shapiro made, but I have a couple more questions for you. Are, this is actually gonna be interesting, if, if we have any. It's a, it's a smaller crowd, but do we have any Democrats in the crowd that are Second Amendment supporters? Now, one thing, now I, that sounds a little funny, I'm sure, but one thing I think we need to understand that's very important is we do have people across the aisle that are Second Amendment supporters as well, okay? Now, the liberals are one thing, thing that we have to deal with sometimes, and it gets infuriating, but we also have to understand that there are also Republicans out there that are not for the Second Amendment. We have plenty of progressives in both sides of the political aisles, okay? Um... Is anybody here today that doesn't have a stance on the Second Amendment that's here just to figure out where they stand and get a better perspective on either side? Pretty strong crowd, all right, good. <laughs> so we're speaking to everyone here. Well, I'm here to talk to you about a subject that a lot of people will tell you is outdated, old-fashioned, and not even relevant in today's society. And they would say the same thing about the Bible, but they're wrong on both fronts. I'm here to talk to you and inform you on some things in regards to the Constitution. Our founding documents included the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and Bill of Rights were written with weight to every single word. After multiple attempts between Jefferson and Adams and others to get the language right, they came up with something revolutionary, knowing full well that it would put a death warrant on their heads. Our Constitution is what makes America, America. It is the document that separates and sets apart our country from all the others. Yes, we have our faults. I think we need to admit those sometimes. We continue to have them. But as a country, we have and will overcome those because of the setup of our system and the tenacity of our citizens. How is our Constitution different than other countries? Well, unlike other countries, instead of listing our rights, Ours was molded by minds with the ever-present tyranny looming over their shoulders. Instead of listing our rights, they listed things that the government cannot do to you. And I think that's very important. It binds the hands of government from getting out of control and becoming a tyrannical regime. Not many people learn about that angle in school, though, if it's even learned at all. But now that you know, I want you to take a listen to some of these. The First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the free speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Congress shall make no law regarding these. This is a limitation on the government, not us. The Second Amendment, we can get a, get a round of applause for that. That's why we're here for today. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Be infringed by who? Let's hear it, guys. Come on, get a little bit more interactive. The government. <laughs> 
The Fourth Amendment, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated and no warrant shall be issued, but upon probable clause, supported by oath or affirmation, particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Who would search without a warrant or seize property? The government again, right? And so on and so on. You read through the Constitution, these are all limits on our government, which is the exact opposite of what you see in most countries around the world, which is telling you what your rights are. This is telling our government what they can't do to us. And I think once people start realizing that and rereading our founding documents, they gain a whole new appreciation for what America was actually built upon. So let's head back to why we're actually here today, and that is the Second Amendment. Who is a well-regulated militia? Raise your hand. Everybody raise your hand. Every single one of us is part of that well-regulated militia. Every able-bodied man, woman, and child in this country that is able to responsibly handle a firearm is there as part of the militia to keep this government in check. And I'd say for hunting too and other purposes as well. So is it, is it for hunting purposes? Yes. Is it for personal defense? Yes. But it shall not be infringed. So it doesn't matter what your reason is for a firearm. If you have one, it's your right to have one. That's right. That's right. <laughs> one, of, one of the best questions that you get from people, especially on the left, is, well, why do you need an AR-15? Well, who the heck are you to tell me what I do or don't need for self-defense? It doesn't matter. Shall not be infringed. So, is it for dense, uh, defense against a tyrannical government? Yes. Absolutely. It's amazing how we hear daily that the Trump administration is a fascist dictatorship, and yet they fight for our firearms to be taken away and only used by this said regime. By the way, the Pennsylvania Constitution is arguably better than the federal level. Article 1, Section 21 of the Pennsylvania State Constitution states, the right of citizens to bear arms in defense of themselves and the state shall not be questioned. A little bit stronger language there for you. For decades and centuries, we have had people fighting for their constitutional rights, the women's suffrage movement, the civil rights movement, to be equal to their fellow man. And for the first time in our history, we have people fighting for their rights to be taken away. Think about how crazy that is. So let's go down that road for a second, though, so each and every one of you can realize just how dangerous the loss of our Second Amendment would be to our nation. If the Second Amendment is gone, what is to stop any of the other amendments being stripped from our Constitution? Nothing. Exactly. I like this guy's passion. Put him up front. <laughs> if you enjoy and appreciate protesting events like this, you are taking advantage of the First Amendment. If that is taken from us, your right to comment on, criticize, or otherwise speak freely is reliant on the whim of your party being in power. And I can guarantee you that the political pendulum will always swing, and those in power will always call for the silencing of others on the other side of the aisle. So yes, I am outright telling you right now that the Second Amendment grants us, as citizens, the opportunity to hold our government accountable to protect the rest of the Bill of Rights. It is the only amendment that defends all the other amendments. So how many of you are familiar with the name Mark Robinson? My wife, that's it. You guys need to listen to my podcast more. I'll tell you a little bit more about that after I get done here. <laughs> Mr. Robinson stood in front of his city council in Greensboro, North Carolina, and gave the I am the majority speech this year. Okay, does that ring a bell to anyone? There you go. He said, when you are all going, uh, when are you all going to start standing up for the majority? And here's who the majority is. I'm the majority. I'm a law-abiding citizen who's never shot anybody never committed a serious crime, never committed a felony. But it seems like every time we have one of these shootings, nobody wants to put the blame where it goes, which is at the shooter's feet. You want to put it at my feet. You want to turn around and restrict my rights, my constitutional right that's spelled out in black and white from buying a firearm to protect myself from the very people that we're here talking about. You need to look up Mark Robinson because his speech is pretty amazing. It, was, it went on and on and he did a great job. But he couldn't have said it better than what he, the way he put it. Instead of punishing those that commit the laws, the solution is always to punish those that follow the law. 
There, and Dean mentioned this before, there are upwards of 310 million firearms in the United States, and less than 1% of them are ever used in a violent crime. As a matter of fact, the majority of gun deaths are from suicides, which feeds right into our argument that there is something wrong with people, not the firearms. That's right. How about this? Many of you, I'm sure, on social media and other places have been seeing graphs that people have been posting up a lot in regards to how bans on guns work in other countries, Australia, New Zealand, Ireland. And what it says on those graphs is that when instituted, the gun deaths go down. I'm going to give you a little teaser here. It's, it's actually true. The gun deaths do go down. But for obvious reasons, there's less guns in the society. What they don't tell you, though, is deceiving. What they don't show you is that the overall homicide rate increases after right. these gun bans. Right. And the reason for that is because you have emboldened the criminals to go after people that are now defenseless. And whether they're using guns, it doesn't matter. They're still killing. They're using some other type of object to do this. You know, we used to teach gun safety and practice shooting in schools. Believe it or not, <laughs> some of you probably remember. I, I was on the right in the back end of uh, seeing kids carrying shotguns in the back of their truck store school. But in today's headlines, they read of students getting expelled for cutting out a piece of paper into the shape of a gun, eating a pop tart into the shape of a gun, getting caught with a three-inch GI Joe figurine gun, even pointing their fingers or playing with imaginary. Why would schools' zero tolerance policies be so ridiculous? Well, that's because we have a progressive politicians on both sides that want to ingrain a fear into these children around the subject of guns at an early age so that when that generation grows up, they will be the politicians who can easily pass gun control laws. The product of progressivism is years down the line. It's a long game, okay? I, th I think you guys... If you don't understand that already, you really need to understand that these David Hoggs and Emma Gonzalez's that are out there in front of the media and everything, they, they're not getting anywhere because the statistics are against them. But they know that if they put this fear into the students now that are growing up, they will be the next generation of politicians that can do something about it. It all sounds so depressing. It's enough to get you angry. I know there's, there's anger here today, and, and that's why we're all here. But I'm not angry, okay? I am actually stand here full of hope. While millennials are a mixed bag that lean more towards the socialist Bernie Sanders mentality, it is the next generation after that that you should be focusing on. You see, the left has overplayed their hand the last couple years. These children have grown up watching their older siblings and parents wearing pussy hats and throwing bigger temper tantrums than them, <laughs> rioting and screaming at the sky, all just over election results. They see the insanity of walking on eggshells to not offend people, but realize everything offends the easily offendable. They've seen the demonization of the family and marriage and divorce rates of over 60% today. Believe it or not, there is actually uh, multiple articles being written by worried media members about how conservative this next generation actually is. Even shining examples like our local Easton high, uh, high School student Andrew who spoke earlier. And that gives me a lot of hope. Now I know that the majority of you are well-informed citizens. If you weren't, you probably wouldn't be here today. And you would have raised your hand on when I asked you if uh, you didn't have a position to take yet. But you should be able to handle these counter arguments when you come into people, in contact with people in society. Because it is facts, statistics, and the Constitution ultimately, and you as a citizen, that will win this battle for the Second Amendment, not feelings. So thank you very much, guys. And then we're going to give away a couple more prizes. Thank you very much.